Hello,、uh, I'm Noam Hassenfeld. This is Unexplainable, Vox's science podcast about everything researchers don't know and are still trying to figure out. We're doing a live taping of our show here at the Aspen Ideas Festival. So thank you so much for the Aspen Institute for having us. I've got two guests with me today, who are exploring a particularly interesting unknown, which is: Do animals talk to each other? And if they do, will humans ever be able to translate what they're saying? So first, Karen Bakker. She's written a whole book on this question. It's called *The Sounds of Life*. She's also a professor at the University of British Columbia, and her research focuses on how digital tools can address some of today's most pressing questions. Karen, thanks for being here. Thanks. And then we have Aza Raskin, who's working directly on this problem. He's a co-founder of the Earth Species Project, a nonprofit that's trying to decode animal communication using artificial intelligence. Aza, thanks so much for being here too. I'm glad to be here. So we're going to have a conversation for about 40 or so minutes, and then we're going to save time for a Q&A at the end. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions about how to talk to animals, so keep them in mind. We'll come to you when we can.、Uh, so just to start, before we get into how researchers are trying to decode animal sounds today,、uh, I think it's worth talking about how. They realized they were worth decoding in the first place. So, Karen, you have a story in your book about how Euro- European and American scientists really started to discover that these sounds were even worth exploring. And you talk about whale song. So, I wonder if you could just set the scene for us a little. Like, what was the state of research on ocean sounds, maybe like a hundred years or so ago? Yeah. So, cast your mind back to about a hundred years ago. Western science, very dominated by Enlightenment thinking. You know.、Uh, Humans, I think, therefore, I am, and humans are the only species to possess reason.、Mm-hmm. There's a widespread assumption that only humans possess language, and moreover, that other species do not possess complex communication capacity. This is, of course, a blind spot in Western science that we're going to unpack throughout the course of the conversation today. But at the time, one of the most remarkable aspects. Of Western science was really a kind of a sin of omission. There wasn't a lot of work done recording animal sounds. There wasn't a lot of work done trying to decode them, and that all changed when a number, a small number of researchers, some of them associated with then classified Navy efforts to listen to underwater ocean sounds, began attempting to decode. And categorize the really complex underwater sounds they were hearing in the ocean. So these scientists made early efforts, mostly to record the pretty profound and amazing sounds that whales make, which are now well known to us,、mm-hmm. but at the time were pretty astounding to Western scientists. You know, the, the kind of operatic ululations of humpback whales, the very staccato, powerful eardrum blasting sounds of sperm whales. Um, there's a whole symphony under the ocean,、um, of which Western science was largely unaware. Their work came to public attention when a renegade scientist named Roger Payne and his brilliant wife Katie Payne, a classically trained musician, took some classified recordings that a Navy scientist had given them and published them. Some of you might remember as.、Um, Uh, an album, which remains the best-selling nature album of all time, went platinum,、mm-hmm. and was one of the major things that changed the dynamic around the campaign to end industrial whaling. What was arguably one of the things that saved many whale species from extinction. That recording actually went out into space, right? Yep. Yeah, one of the one. earlier, right? Exactly. One, yeah. So after that, there was a cascade of research which documented that a number of whale species have complex communication. Moreover, they have culture, which they transmit from one generation to the next. We've discovered that、uh, orcas, for example, have dialects that are very coherent to their family groups, and the cultural transmission、uh, is just the start of what we've begun to learn about whales. And so, whales were our, our, if you like, our re-entry as as Western scientists into something indigenous cultures had long known. Mm-hmm. That many many species are capable of complex communication, and、uh, from there, many other species have begun essentially to reveal themselves to Western science. But I want to emphasize right at the start: this is long-held human knowledge 
that somehow we have forgotten that we had forgotten mm -hmm. and we have just begun remembering really how to remember. Yeah, before I go to Aza, I, just something you said there that I think is worth trying to unpack for a second. You mentioned dialects, and I feel like that's definitely not a word that I think most people would associate with animals. When you're talking about orca dialects, what, what exactly does that mean? How would researchers know that orcas have a dialect? Yeah, so first of all, um, the word dialect is used as a technical term with many species. Honeybees have dialects, different hives are recognizable by their unique signature. The same is true for bats. Same is true for many other species, including orcas or humpback whales. Mm -hmm. So what that means in technical terms is simply on the basis of listening to the sounds they make, there are unique uh, patterns in terms of pitch, pace, tone, you know, all the things you can imagine quantifying acoustically that are sufficiently distinct and unique to that group usually a, a, in the orca case, a small family group, a pod group, that simply by listening, a trained scientist or indeed an AI could tell which group that orca is coming from. And those are invariant. They tend to be invariant across uh, generations. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, they seem to also delimit the extent to which orcas interbreed. So they, they are, they are cultural in terms of the scientific definition of the transmission of culture, and they seem to have really important behavioral implications for how these species interact with one another. Okay. So, you know, talking about things that we've forgotten or maybe things that we were not aware of uh, until very recently, you know, it's not just these sounds under the water, right? It's not just deep sounds that we haven't been able to hear because we didn't have submarines. Uh, Aza, I wonder if you can tell us a bit about some of these sounds that we can't hear without technology that are around us all the time, that maybe are going through the air or through the floor. Like, w what other animals are communicating in ways that we don't even notice? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, our, our ability to understand is limited by our ability to perceive. And, mm -hmm. you know, what does AI do fundamentally is that it throws open the aperture of that which we can perceive and hence will understand. But I think, you know, I can imagine sitting in the audience, and you're like, okay, really talking to animals, do animals really speak? Maybe they have dialects. Um, I'm just gonna do rapid fire examples of things that we like learned as we started going out into the field, talking to scientists, to give you a sense. So to go for um, uh, like orca dialects and other dialects, those dialects, it turned out, can like sometimes are mutually intelligible. They can drift far enough apart, become mutually unintelligible. There is a case off the coast huh. of Norway every year um, were a group of false killer whales, phenomenologically speaking one way, and a group of dolphins speaking a different way, come together and hunt in a superpod. And when they do, they speak a third different thing. What? Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's like one of those moments you're like, uh, here's another one. Um, University of Hawaii, 1994. This is an unpublished thesis, but the methodology was, was very good. It was actually following on a set of other research. Um, and in this study, they were teaching dolphins two gestures. So the first gesture meant do something you've never done before, right? And that's already a crazy thing because it's saying innovate. Um, and the dolphins do. They remember everything they've done before that session, understand the concept of negation, not one of those things and then invent something whole cloth new they've never done before. That's already super cool. But then they would teach a second gesture to the dolphins, do something together. And they would say to two dolphins, do something you've never done before at the same time. But the dolphins are separated, the right? The dolphins are okay, separated. So dolphins cannot see each other. Correct. They're given the same yeah, instructions. Signals. They, go yeah. Down, they do exchange sonic information, and they come out and they do the same thing they have never done before at the same time. And then that's replicated over multiple dolphin pairs. Um, so it doesn't prove representational language, but I sort of think it puts the null hypothesis on the other foot. You know, like, how else are, are they doing this? Um, and then just to like continue expanding the aperture for a second, uh, let's talk about plants, um, okay. <laughs> right? Because, um, so uh, University of Tel Aviv 2019 did this incredible study. They're like, okay, nature abhors a vacuum. Um, so do you think flowers can hear the sound of an approaching bee? And so they took primrose flowers 
and they played different pitches. You know, high pitch noises like bat noises, low pitch noises like traffic, and then um, only, it turned out, when they played the sound of an approaching pollinator, <clears throat> did the flowers respond. And within just a couple of seconds, they would produce more and sweeter nectar. Right? And so, like, literally, the flower hears the sound of an approaching bee and gets excited. And you're like, okay, so flowers now are hearing, but do plants, like, emit sound, like the vernacular speak? But, you know, do they, do they make sound? Same lab um, started to stress out to, uh, plants. So they stressed out tomato plants and tobacco plants of some kind of plant torture. They, would, they cut them. Yeah. yeah. Or and dehydrate dehydrated them. them. Um, and listen to yeah. them. Yeah, it was, it was plant torture. Um, ethics reviewed. Ethics reviewed <laughs> plant torture. Um, uh, and what they discovered is that the more stressed out the plants are, the more they emit sound. Um, and not quietly, it's a, at the same decibel level as humans speak. They're just up at 50 or 60 kilohertz, so we can't hear them. And so now we have plants hearing and speaking. The world is awash in meaning and signal that we are just unaware of. Like if you walked out into a field when it's sort of drying, you would you'd be gaining huge amounts of knowledge. Um, and so when you hear that, you're like, okay, so, so maybe animals communicating is, is not that far-fetched. And I just want to play one thing for you guys, um, which is, can you guess what species makes this sound? Let's see. Right? I, I like, yeah, it is a kind of whale. Um, this is a beluga. Um, and mind you, this is just a microphone stuck into water, so it sounds digital. That's just how they sound. Um, they're speaking up to 150 kilohertz. We only hear up to 20 kilohertz. And the, it, so it's interesting, right? It sounds sort of like modem packets. Um, it turns out dolphins have names that they call each other by, often given to them by their mothers, like near birth. Um, Ian Yannick in 2016 discovered that the dolphins will use the names even in the third person when the other dolphin is not around. So like we're hallmark of language, being able to talk about something that is not here. Um, do, uh, belugas have the same thing, but instead of like a signature whistle, they have more of a modem-like packet. It also includes their clan identity. Um, bats and have something similar. Bats, like bat species. Uh, parakeets, yeah. um, a whole bunch of animals, it turns out, have this kind of like, they can, they can say their name. Um, and here's the stat that blew my mind, um, and also just like open up the aperture of wonder, is Valeria Vergara, Dr. Valeria Vergara, who did this research to discover beluga names. She has tags that sit on animals, um, so they record like video, audio, how the animal's moving, and even though she has that, she has to throw away 97% of her data. She can't analyze the supermajority of her data because you can't tell who's speaking huh. or they're overlapping because you can't separate them out into their own individual tracks. That requires AI. And so this is where your ears should perk up because the most vocal underwater species, the supermajority of data has been unanalyzed and unknown to Western science. Like that is where you find your next frontier. I, I do want to pull back out for one minute and explain uh, a point that Aza, you touched on, which is really important. The vast majority of these sounds are inaudible to the naked human ear. Mm -hmm. They are either above our hearing range in the high ultrasound or below our he hearing range in the deep infrasound. There is an evolutionary reason for this called the acoustic niche hypothesis. So in most ecosystems, what you get is um, much like radio stations on the radio dial, You'll have different species essentially broadcasting acoustic communication at a specific set of frequencies, a band, and also being able to hear in that same frequency range. So the tomato plants that you talked about, corn, right, Monica Gagliano's work, mm -hmm. um, we, tend, we hear pretty much at the frequencies that we are able to vocalize at. So um, the ability to record beyond human hearing range is only about 100 years old for ultrasound and infrasound. The vast majority of data that we gathered was not analyzable by analog techniques. Imagine the cacophony of a bat cave. But what AI does is it allows the parsing, the categorizing of that data at scale. And so we reverse a very fundamental constraint of uh, 20th century biology. 
we used to have a, basically a scarcity of data. Mm -hmm. Now we have a hyperabundance of data uh -huh. because of cheap digital recording devices. Moore's law applies, yeah. right? Many, many such recording devices from the Arctic to the Amazon. And now we have AI that can do some, not all, automated tracking, categorizing, parsing. That doesn't mean we can actually then make the next step to translating, but it gets us a lot further. And so I, I'd like you to think about this. The analog is to optics. 400 years ago, those who invented the microscope, you know, Van Leeuwenhoek, when he discovered his animalcules, he thought he was crazy. The people told, mm -hmm. he told, thought he was crazy, but eventually he gets published, you know, in the Royal Society Journal, and of course, there was no idea at the time that the invention of the microscope would lead to the discovery of DNA and the ability to manipulate the code of life. Nor were the early inventors of the telescope aware that their device would eventually allow us to see back in time nearly to the origins of the universe. Today, with digital acoustics, we are literally like those early inventors of optics. We're just walking around listening, pretty much you know, annotating and categorizing sound, but we really have no idea what we're going to discover. But it is a vast, vast frontier. And so my personal belief is that sonics is the new optics. And I'd like to say a bit more about that later because that also applies to humans. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it actually applies across the tree of life. So you're, you're talking about now using AI, using this more data we've had, using AI to analyze it. Aza, I wonder if you can talk a little, a little bit about the research you've done with using AI to map things like shapes of languages. Like how does AI help us translate between languages when we might not be able to understand them. Yeah, so I'm gonna tell this story in two parts. Um, and the reason why we started Earth Species in 2017 was that something fundamental changed, right? Because if you're gonna to try to translate a language without a, Rosetta, without a Rosetta Stone, it'd be really helpful to have a tool that helps you translate a language without a Rosetta Stone. That didn't exist in human history up until like 2017. Then that changed, so what changed? AI gained the ability to build shapes that represent languages. For those of you that are AI people in the room, these are called latent spaces or embedding spaces. But these shapes are really interesting because they turn semantic relationships into geometric relationships. What does that mean? Think about uh, a language like English. Now imagine a galaxy where every star is a word. And words that mean similar things are near each other and then words that share a semantic relationship share a geometric relationship. So, King is to man as woman is to queen. So in this shape, king is the same distance direction to man as woman is to queen. So you just do king minus man, that gives you a distance and direction. You add that to boy and it'll equal prince. You add that to girl, it'll equal princess. Um, like all the internal relationships of a language are encoded in this shape. The very first thing I tried, I'll say this without comment, um, was I was like, okay, hipster minus authenticity. <laughs> Whatever that relationship is, add it to conservative and the computer spat out electability, which, okay, <laughs> right? Who knows? Anyway, but it's like, it's a fascinating shape. Um, and if you think about it, like, you know, dog has relationship to like man and to wolf and to fur and to yelp and to howl. Um, it is sort of fixes it in a point in space in this shape. And then if you solve the massive multidimensional Sudoku puzzle of every concept to every other concept, out pops this rigid structure representing all of the internal relationships of a language. It, the computer doesn't know what anything means, it just knows how they relate. And here was the deep insight from 2017. Could the shape of two languages possibly be the same? So I'm holding a Portuguese word cloud here. Yeah. You're holding an English one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the mathematical relationship between the stars in my galaxy that represent uh, woman, queen, king, man, is more or less the same mathematical, that is spatial relationship in yeah, your word cloud. Exactly. If I were to throw up Cree or Inuktitut, a little bit less overlap, but more or less, a lot of these concepts are invariant across human languages. And that is why we are able to really effectively translate now using AI between the, our different word clouds. That's exactly right. You literally <laughs> just rotate one shape on top of the other. And even though there are words in one language that don't exist in the other, the point which is dog ends up in the same spot in both and you sort of blur your eyes and they're the same shape and that works for English and Spanish and you're like, cool, those are related languages, obviously, but also works for Finnish, which is a weird language, and Aramaic and Urdu. 
um, Esperanto, like every human language sort of roughly fits in this universal human meaning shape. And that was the moment that we're like, there's a path through. Do you think if we build this shape for animal communication, it fits somewhere in the universal human meaning shape and the parts that overlap, we should be able to directly translate into the human experience and the parts that don't overlap, we should be able to see complexity. And you know, humans have been passing down culture for what, like 100,000, 300,000 years? Whales and dolphins for 34 million years. Um, and can you imagine like that which is oldest correlates with that which is wisest? They're not the same, of course, but for something to have survived that long. Um, and I always like to think about this, which is whatever it is that are the solutions to humanity's problems, they're not in our, in our imagination. Because if there were, we'd probably be doing them. Mm -hmm. And so this gives us the ability to start getting like blurry Polaroid images of things that are beyond the human imagination. Let's go back one step to this notion <laughs> that we can translate between mm -hmm. our, you know, different word clouds, you know, English and Inuktitut, yeah. um, and then extrapolate that to non-human communication systems. So first of all, you have to imagine that scientists now have the ability to create these kind of latent spaces or word clouds with non-human communication regimes. For example, there is now an elephant dictionary mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. thousands of sounds and, and field ecologists have, field biologists have painstakingly documented what each of those signals mean. Elephants, for ex African elephants, for example, have a specific signal for honeybee. They're terrified of honeybees, mm. way more than any, any, of any, almost any other creature. They can get into their trunks and their ears and sting them. And so there's a very specific behavior elephants display when they hear the, uh, the sound. So tested through playback experiments, we have this elephant dictionary. But there are many ifs here because the assumption that the underlying worldview, the felt lived embodied experience of an elephant, the umwelt, mm -hmm. um, as researchers call it, is anything like a human, um, is, is one we haven't yet proven. And so my word cloud may not contain any concepts that actually overlap with ASAs, with the exception of a very few. So it may be that AI translation is either a dead end, mm -hmm. or it would only allow us to develop a small subset of translatable concepts um, and that there are other rules governing these non-human communication systems that we've yet to figure out. I'll just give a couple examples. One is that human language tends to be invariant over space and time. The word for water is the same at morning, at night, in winter, and in summer. It may be that animal species have different languages for different times of year. A little bit like, you know, if you're familiar with Indian classical music, ragas, you know, there's the morning raga, the evening raga. So you have to throw out all of your assumptions about language. Maybe they have different languages for different parts of the world if they're migratory. The Bering Strait may have a different language than the warm waters of Hawaii, where you give birth. So we, we are just really at the beginning of trying to figure out whether what Aza is trying to do is achievable. My personal bet, and I'd love to hear your mm. view, is that the, there will be an incomplete translation. We will be able to detect names, mm -hmm. we'll be able to detect alarm calls, and we'll be able to detect the, uh, detect the labels that are given to sort of um, features of the environment that are linguistically invariant. Mm -hmm. But there are many, many more complex concepts that we're gonna have to invent entirely new types of science to begin understanding. And those are gonna combine field observations with AI. Yeah, absolutely, and I just wanna, say that like all of our work is built off of decades of painstaking research done by biologists out in the field. We've gone to the Congo rainforest to work with like forest elephant researchers. It is hard work. Do you, do you guys know that ants, for instance, in the Congo um, are one, attracted to electromagnetic radiation and two, chew through metal? Like, <laughs> this is hard, hard work. And everything we do is hence in collaboration. But then just to, to add a couple, couple thoughts to, to what you're saying is, one, the way we're describing doing this, this kind of translation with rotation, that's 2017 AI tech. It's now sort of stone age. There are like many other techniques which I can talk about that like that becomes just one tool among many. But why should we expect, like I agree, like the umwelt of a sperm whale might be so completely different. It spends 80% of its life in complete darkness, a kilometer deep in the ocean. Why should we expect there to be any overlap whatsoever? And I'll give two examples that I think are very profound examples for why there might be overlap. Um, and then I'll sort of talk about the parts that, like why I think this goes even beyond language. Um, the first example is that, um, you know, and you can talk about this too, is like the, the mirror test. Do you guys know about the mirror test? It's like, it's a, how, how do you know whether another being has self-awareness? 
One way you might discover that is you would paint a dot on them where they are unaware of that dot. Then you put a mirror in front of them. And if they see the dot and they start to like try to get it off, that shows that they're connecting the image in the mirror with themselves, that they have a self-image. Now, if they don't respond, that doesn't actually tell you anything. Uh, researchers thought for the longest time that elephants couldn't pass the mirror test, but it turns out they're just using small mirrors. Um, <laughs> right? So this is, I think, but a number of species do pass this kind of mirror test, and that means if they're communicating, they may well be communicating about a rich interiority, like a self-awareness, one of the most profound things that we have. Another example, um, as I, I have this in my presentations, an incredible video of lemurs um, biting centipedes to get high. So they're like taking hits off of centipedes. They get super cuddly. They enter these trance-like states. It's sort of like a proto-burning man. Um, <laughs> and like dolphins do the same thing. They will intentionally inflate puffer fish um, also to get high off of their venom and pass them around in the original puff puff pass. Um, <laughs> right, so it, gorillas and chimpanzees will spin, they'll hang on a vine and spin to get really dizzy. Transcendent states of consciousness appears to be a thing that we share and desire across many species. So that too is like a very profound thing that if we communicate or if they communicate, they may well communicate about. So there are some like, I think, really interesting areas of overlap, but then I want to sort of like jump and be like, I think a very fair critique would be like, cool, all human languages overlap because um, we share a sensorium, we share the same hardware. Body plan. Yeah, body plan. We live in roughly the same world. Um, but here's the thing, is AI, these same techniques, it turns out can do this across modality. Have you guys seen like all of the image the text to image generation, like Dolly, you type in something and out comes mm -hmm. an image that's never existed before. How does that work? You build the shape that represents language, you build the shape that represents images, all the internal relationships of images. You look at image caption pairs on the internet, you, it's no longer a rotation, but you align these two shapes. And then you just say something in language space, you translate it to image space, you ask the AI to generate the image there, and you're now doing translation from language into <laughs> images, and this works across it seems every modality, video, fMRIs, DNA, AI is learning to treat everything with the same rough 200 lines of code as a kind of image, and that lets us do, I think, a whole bunch of more really interesting things, like translating between how an animal moves and the behavior it says. So uh, I wanna, uh, I just, yeah, okay, I wanna, go, go ahead, go yeah, ahead. I'd, I'd like to just, back to one thing, <laughs> sure, one yeah, yeah. One thing. I, this conversation we're having, you know, on, on one sense it can feel like we're just, we're like speeding ahead and there's this one other hurdle we have to pass, which mm. is like figuring out this translation. The AI is almost there. It's also, we're also using a lot of anthropomorphic language, mm. like uh, the plants are excited or the plants are stressed. And, and I feel like that is definitely, I, I understand why we would do that. It, it's not, we don't have better words I mean, I want to clarify that scientists do not use that language. Okay. They use very technical terms. So, for example, scientists would not use the, the term name. They would say individual vocal label or vocal signature. Equally, most of the scientists studying the communicative regimes of non-human species would use the term communication, not language, because language is sufficiently um, anthropocentrically defined in terms of, you know, uh, complex combinatorial capacity, mm -hmm. symbolic content, syntax, so on and so forth. Uh, that uh, it is as yet to be proven that other species have quote-unquote language. But uh, whereas this was a very live debate 30 years ago, the majority of researchers working on animal species today have just decided to set the debate aside and say, look, their communication regimes are so interesting that I'm going to study that on my own mm -hmm. and leave the debate about whether or not this is language to the philosophers. In the meantime, I'm learning a lot about bats, which is very cool. So I, I, I just want to clarify that Although Aza and I, in, in a, a, like a sort of a public communication of science way, sure. are using these terms, the mm -hmm. scientific community is pretty rigorous, mm -hmm. perhaps incorrectly so, but mm -hmm. nonetheless pretty rigorous about setting a boundary between humans and non-human species. But one of the things that this research may eventually do is create a sufficient weight of evidence that we do indeed say, ah yes, 
other species have language, we may need to change our definition of language in order to do so. Or, ah, yes, other species do convey symbolic meaning through language, and here's how. We're not there yet. So, so that, now this might seem semantic, might seem pedantic, but I actually think it's extremely important because it gets back again to this fundamental set of assumptions that were set up at around the time of the Enlightenment with respect mm -hmm. to Western science, which is only humans possess language and reason. Non-humans are essentially automata, unable to reason, unable to feel. Some scientists at the time thought, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, progressively, I think this science is going to lead us somewhere very, very interesting in terms of asking these fundamental questions on the basis of a, a, a huge amount of empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, we, we briefly mentioned the umwelt question and about what does it mean to be a bat or a whale or any of these things that completely perce perceive the world completely differently. And I guess I just wonder if we could be communicating something to the animal that the animal would be potentially understanding in a different way and acting in a way that looks like what we expect the animal to act because that's how we're understanding things. But will we ever, is it even possible to imagine that we could actually communicate where we both know that we are understanding each other? I mean, the same problem exists between yeah. uh, any two humans. Yeah, the, right? the myth of communication <laughs> is that it ever happened in the first place. Yeah, so uh, the, I think the, 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 the practical, pragmatic, scientific response is playback experiments, mm -hmm. and, and that is how these are tested. We assume this sig uh, acoustic signal means this. We can play it back in the field or in lab con controlled conditions. We see the response is what we predict. Elephant honeybee alarm call leads to very specific physical behaviors, the group of elephants coming together, dusting themselves. Now, beyond that, I mean, the act of communication is a profound mystery. The ability of any two beings on Earth to believe they can actually understand one another is sort of, it is, it is actually quite magical. So, mm. sci so, of course, there are many ways. So science is one of the ways of approaching some of the great mysteries, and mm -hmm. communication is one of them. But the reason I think this captures so much public imagination, is, and I have talked about this in the past, is because this is also a great mystery which has been the subject of much reflection in you know, various mythological and spiritual traditions. Most cosmological worldviews um, would express some sort of view that at um, one time humans were able to communicate with animals who served as a kind of guide mm -hmm. or interlocutor between humans and the non-human world, um, or and or that one time we all spoke the same language and there was mutual intelligibility. So the, the, the human yearning to speak to other species is very archetypal, Ordeal, yeah. very, very deep. And, and so that is some of the richness of this mm -hmm. work. It's also some of the controversy that it inspires in the scientific mm -hmm. community. Well, think about the number of uh, even more modern traditions, I guess you could say. Um, I don't know if I'll, say, I'll take that back. But just the number of uh, like religions that begin with language, right? In the beginning, there was the word. Or in the Ayurvedic traditions, the universe begins with om. Mm -hmm. Like there's something deep in like human psychology that says we are humans the language users and to go back to your analogy of like ai being like the new kind of optics it's like the last time we invented the telescope what did we discover we looked at, at the universe and discovered that earth was not the center and this time i think what we're going to discover as we use ai to look at, at the patterns of the universe is humanity is not yeah. at the center so optics decentered humanity from the center of the solar system Sonics or acoustics decenters humanity from the tree of life. I think you and I both share the view that we'll realize we're not at the pinnacle yeah. or not at the center in the way we thought we once were. The, the other point that's really interesting here is this notion of sacred sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so as scientists have begun doing this work, which often just involves picking up a digital acoustic device and saying, hey, I wonder if this particular species makes sound. Oh, they do. I wonder if they can sense sound. Ooh, they can. I mean, what we're finding is that many, many creatures, including those without ears or any apparent means of hearing, are exquisitely sensitive to sound. I'll give one example, coral larva. So if you've ever had the, the privilege of being out swimming on a reef at the moment of a, a mass spawning event, 
they usually occur around the time of the full moon and they're like these underwater fireworks like the entire reef explodes with these these multicolored larvae the, these tiny larvae are um, essentially blobs they uh, don't have a central nervous system they're microscopic they're on the reef for maybe a few hours and then they wash out to sea where they sort of grow a little bit and eventually they, they settle on a reef somewhere and scientists long thought that those larvae were essentially helpless. They were randomly pushed around by wind, waves, and currents. But recently, a, a group of very, very clever scientists did some experiments with coral larvae, mm. where they demonstrated coral larvae can hear. They can distinguish between the sounds of degraded reefs and healthy reefs. They prefer healthy reefs. They can also distinguish between the sound of any random healthy reef and their home reef. They prefer their home reef and they will swim back towards it across miles of open ocean. Now, so imagine if I were to show you a picture, it looks like a little amoeba. It has cilia. The cilia are much like the hairs in your ears that are enabling you to listen to me right now. So we don't exactly know how they do it, but the best guess is the cilia allow the coral larva to detect the sound of the coral reef when they're born. So they imprint on it like a coral lullaby. They wash out to sea, they can hear the sound of the reef, and they use the cilia to swim back towards home. Pretty profound. And it opens up the door to the following hypothesis, which is that every living entity is sensitive to sound. If you think about it, it makes sense. The oceans, before we had eyes, it would have been evolution, evolutionarily advantageous to sense sound because that's how you know where your predators are, your prey is, your mates are, your food is, et cetera, et cetera. So if we assume that everything in the world is exquisitely sensitive to sound, we start then looking in very different places for understanding essentially interconnection and relationships across the tree of life. And the punchline here is, and then noise pollution, which yeah. in renders us unable to sense these sounds becomes much, much more important. And this is a new wave of environmental health and human health um, concerns, the, the, the incredible impacts that noise pollution has on all species, including us. Yes, yes, yeah. Before we, so we, I just wanna save a bit of time for Q&A, but yeah. one issue we haven't touched on <coughs> is sort of a should issue. Yeah. And assuming we can use AI to analyze these language shapes, to figure out in some basic sense what animals may be saying to each other, maybe we can communicate with them, maybe we can listen to them. If we do, I, I, if we find out we're not at the center of the universe, knowing humans, I can imagine there would be some maybe not friendly ways to approach that situation. And I'm wondering what you think about like the danger of being able to understand mm -hmm. animals and being able to communicate with them. So I want to give, <clears throat> excuse me, like a, a really specific example um, of the new responsibility that we as a species are going to have to show up to in the very, very near future. So you guys, I'm sure, have encountered ChatGPT. Um, you can build chatbots like ChatGPT in Chinese even if you do not speak Chinese, right? And you've probably also seen like all of the deepfake stuff. Um, now it is possible with just three seconds of anyone's voice to continue to speak in their voice and say what they were saying. Um, and what this means is that in, you know, within months to short number of years, we will be able to build essentially synthetic chatbots, synthetic whales, synthetic belugas, synthetic um, tool using crows that can speak um, in a way that, you know, they don't understand they're not speaking to one of their own. Sort of imagine you had the superpower and your superpower was like be able to walk up to somebody um, whose language you don't understand, you sort of cock your ear and you listen, you're like, okay, I see this pattern after this pattern. You start to babble with those patterns and you don't know what you're saying, but the other person's like, yeah, wow. It's really Douglas Adams' it. Babelfish. It is, except here's the plot twist. You will be able to communicate before you understand. And so this is, this is actually the case. Mm. We're actually starting our first um, experiments with zebra finch likely later this year. We're doing real-time two-way communication with captive population to see can we do like start to cross this communications barrier by being able to speak before we understand and this is fascinating it obviously lets us start to get to decode much faster um but humpback so, humpback whale song goes viral right like songs sung off the coast of australia for whatever reason like 
Australian humpbacks are like the K-pop singers. Um, <laughs> and their songs, like it picked up, they, they go down into the SoFar channel, which is this great um, uh, sort of fiber optic like cable in the ocean. It's the original whale wide web. And often like sperm whale will have like conversations that can like go, you know, a thousand kilometers. Anyway, they, the, the humpback whale song will be picked up by the world population within a season or two sometimes. And so if we're not careful, right, if we just create a whale that starts to sing, especially before we understand what, it's, what it means, we could be messing up a 34 million year old wisdom tradition, mm -hmm. right, creating a kind of whale QAnon. We don't know. Um, and that means before that happens, because that means, like, it's a very like, crazy thing to think of. I didn't think we were going to get here this quickly. In the next, you know, 12 months, five years, certainly before 2030, we will have the capacity to do real-time, two-way communication, animal to AI, not necessarily animal to human. Um, and we need to have a kind of Geneva Convention for Cross-Species Communication, a prime directive, sets of norms, ways that IRBs review. There are a whole bunch of um, things we need to set up, and I think you can talk about that Yeah, too. and I think there are even more nefarious uses. Precision oh, yeah. hunting. Yeah. Precision fishing, of course. Yeah, um, poaching. Yeah, poaching. This will enable the uh, acceleration of the, the kind of cat and mouse game between poachers and gamekeepers, no yeah. doubt. Um, <coughs> there also is the specter of being able to domesticate species that were formerly not domesticatable by mm -hmm. humans. So we may be able to use this in certain contexts, and this is what my next book is about, huh. for biodiversity conservation goals. Uh, at the same time, it could allow bad actors, and keep in mind how, how big the multi-billion dollar global illegal wildlife trade is, right? To further capitalize on their ability to ensnare animals that have so far been, you know, sort of out of reach. So, I, I, so the Geneva Convention long-term for multi-species dialogue, great. Prior to that, I, um, I think we've got a more immediate problem on our hands given the biodiversity crisis. Um, with respect to, um, you know, uh, nefarious uses of these technologies, the only saving grace is that the AI may not be really as good as we think. So, you know, first of all, we're being very, very self-centered here, as usual, we're humans. We're assuming other species actually want to talk to us. Right. Mm. They may be like, boring, you know, <laughs> or they may just assume that, that these sounds, which are gibberish, you know, are to be avoided, rightfully so, or they may simply be able to detect it's not being made by another living member of their species and avoid. So, so my, my hope is that they're going to reveal, we're going to reveal ourselves to be slightly stupider than we think. Mm. They're going to reveal <laughs> themselves to be smarter than we believe, and maybe that'll create a bit more breathing room, but no doubt, longer term, Deep fake AI technology creates a whole bunch of yeah. risks. And, I mean, and do you think? Yeah. I mean, do you think we should, given these risks, you, you think this is something that scientists should push forward on? The, uh, I mean, I believe we should have a moratorium. A's and I don't agree on this point. <laughs> oh. I think. Um, I think there are certainly thresholds that if we cross, we should have a moratorium. We should we should stop. A absolutely. Um, I, my, I, I sort of wonder whether we're going to hit our first contact moment. Um, and then the whale's gonna be like, oh, the humans are back at this part of their cycle. We need a dive, it's not gonna go well for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, he, here's the thing. We are mutilating the tree of life, and at some point, we are going to cut the branch upon which humanity depends, right? So we are in the land of Hail Mary passes. Um, the hope for, uh, I think, working on showing and really, the point is not really to talk to animals. The point is really to understand and listen. Um, and along the path to that, we are creating the technology that solves the fundamental problems we see across all of conservation uh, biology and ethology research. Every um, biologist we talk to needs to do classification, denoising, detection of signals, to understand biodiversity, to understand um, their behaviors. And so the tools we build as we head towards uh, decoding are the fundamental tools that are accelerating conservation biology, which to the extent that conservation science accelerates conservation, like we're trying to broad scale do that. But then there are these moments when we get shifts in perspective and that changes everything. We talked about songs of the humpback whale, but also when human beings went to the moon, 
right? Earth rise and blue marble are still the most viewed photos in world history. And when human beings were dosed with that overview effect and seeing us as a pale blue dot suspended in space, planet, you know, spaceship Earth, right? That's when the EPA came into existence. Um, NOAA was born, modern environmental movement started, Clean Air Acts was passed, and that was in the Nixon era, right? And so the goal here is, like, there are moments in history which superpower movements. There are no silver bullets, but maybe there's silver buckshot. And maybe if we know this is coming, we can arm every other conservation org out there. Rights for nature, personhood for non-humans, um, E.O. Wilson's Half Earth, much bigger marine protected zones. When this becomes the thing that the entire world sees and becomes the top of um, politicians' priority list, suddenly, I think we can accelerate and be a force multiplier for every other conservation and climate action out there. And that, I think, is the reason why it's worth pursuing. I wonder if, yeah, I mean, just before we finish, I, I wonder, could you just say a bit about why you think we should have a moratorium? I will, um, but I do also want to build on Aza's point. Okay. So the, the climate change and biodiversity crisis are intimately interrelated, although they're often treated separately. And the... Um, fundamental challenge of the next 20 or 30 years, as we add a couple billion more humans to the planet, is a sort of a arc, Noah's Ark-like challenge. How many species will be around at the end of our lifetimes? Um, and acoustics, regardless of whether we actually achieve interspecies communication, is a powerful tool in the conservationist's toolkit. Because simply through the use of digital bioacoustics, you have a very low cost, very effective monitoring regime that is much less invasive than visual monitoring or human monitoring. And this is now something that is being set up around the world. Uh, I can't go into the technical details for lack of time, but very simply, bio and ecoacoustic indices allow us to tell simply by listening uh, the extent to which climate change is disrupting species. Uh, species migrations and movements, um, and species abundance or disappearance, etc. So we may never achieve interspecies communication, but what we can do, and we all should be doing if we're interested in environmental work, is supporting the inclusion of digital acoustics, bio and ecoacoustics, into conservation work as a low-cost, minimally invasive, very powerful tool. So I hope that's a, a take-home message for all of you. Um, the question of the moratorium, I think, is, is really one about um, something humans are not very good at. That is, having uh, the ability to um, create a space uh, in between what we think we're capable of doing and reaching for that thing. Mm. So there is a, in the tech community, in the scientific community, there is a, a, a um, can-do ethos. I can do that, and so I want to do it. <laughs> but uh, there is a should-do question here that I think requires very, very careful consideration. And I see no, uh, and I hear I disagree with you, compelling reason right now to continue the work that could be so damaging to other species, um, that could lead to precision hunting and poaching, um, without getting a lot of the ethical uh, frameworks in place. It would mean updating the Convention on International Trade in Endangered mm -hmm. Species, updating a lot of the international environmental regulatory frameworks. AI governance poses a more general problem, right? Yeah. So my view is we need to get our house in order on that. And just like at, from time to time, human genomics research has hit pause and there are certain no-go areas, like cloning humans, I think we can come up with a set of no-go areas for AI science in mm -hmm. this regard that would allow technical progress to still be made, but not be invoking the kind of risks that we barely have even begun to understand. And on okay. that, we actually, I think, agree, which yeah. is that as, <laughs> as we show up to the new responsibility of the power, you have to ask how is that power bound to wisdom and how knowing that this technology is coming, because regardless, the ability to emulate any signal, mm -hmm. that's being pushed by the market forces on the human domain. So we need to accelerate as fast as possible all of the ethics and legal updates. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's, the, it's Pandora's box, yeah. right? Every new technology creates a new responsibility. 
I think there's a small enough set of researchers doing this that we could actually do a better job this time exactly. at sorting out the responsibility before we unleash the technology. I completely agree. So I'm just, it, it, do we have time for a question or two? Maybe just one question? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the back there. Can you just hold on one second? We'll, we'll bring you a mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for the uh, panel today. It was really profound and thought-provoking in how AI could help and help destroy things. I want to uh, <laughs> ask a question that I came in thinking that you were going to talk about, which is, uh, my wife and I, we love our dogs so much. <laughs> <laughs> And I was wondering if there's been any studies about how to speak to domesticated animals like dogs and cats. Do you want to answer? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's a whole movement for dogs having buttons that they press. Um, uh, we have been mostly interested in, um, it's really listening to, to the natural world, so we haven't focused as much on like, like the, the animals that are close to us that have like, domesticated been co-evolved with us um but it's the question we get asked the most frequently right after <laughs> is cats and right after that is baby babble um baby babble um but yes there there is there is starting to be more work done on understanding uh dog communication um is that it no more questions <laughs> okay well then before we go i just wanted to uh, I just want to say thank you. Um, I want to let you know that our show, Unexplainable, has an AI series coming out if you are interested in AI, uh, starting July 12th. It's about how we really don't understand anything about AI. <laughs> so if you want to check that out, you can subscribe to Unexplainable wherever you listen. And thanks once again to the Aspen Institute for having us.